Good morning and welcome to worship at Grace Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. Before we begin our worship, a couple of announcements. Offerings. Uh, you don't need to have your offering envelope to give your offering to Grace Church. We decided not to order envelopes this year. Uh, later on, once we come back together in the church, we can uh, get envelopes again, but we decided to save money and not get the offering envelopes. You will keep your same offering envelope number, however, and remember that you can send a paper check to our post office box, or you can go to our website, gracelanham.org, and hit the Give Now button, or you can set that up as a regular offering. Could be weekly, could be monthly. There's also a phone app, and there's a video that tells you how to do that. Also, for per capita. Now, our presbytery uh, gets a amount of money for each member of each church, and that amount is $42.67 for each member of Grace Church, which we send to the presbytery. Now, we have 300 members on the roll. So that's over $12,000, which we will be sending to the presbytery, but we need our members to help out and give their per capita, which is $42.67. So thank you for helping out there. And now let's worship the Lord together.
God of all glory, on this first day you began creation, bringing light out of darkness. On the first day you began your new creation, raising Jesus Christ from the darkness of death. On this Lord day, Lord's day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the Spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your great glory. Through Jesus Christ, in union with the Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and I'm reading verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voice of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard a voice of the Lord, heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now it's time for the young disciples. So grab your brother or sister and come on down and gather around. So today we're going to look at another stained glass window in the church. As you recall, we looked at the symbol in stained glass that is on the front door of the church, which you have passed through many times, maybe not even noticed. I want to go around and look at the stained glass windows in the church as we have our time with young disciples. Now, today, I'm standing in front of a stained glass window and it has a picture of a book. And what do you suppose that book might be? Well, if you said the Bible, I think that that's a correct answer and good for you. So when people ask us as Christians, what do you believe? Where do you get your beliefs from? We say from the Bible. Now, as Presbyterians, we also have our beliefs that we get from scripture and we put them together in a book that we call the book of confessions so the book of confessions you know you think of confession as like when you do something you're not supposed to do and and you you get in trouble with your parents or your teacher and you say well i have to confess well that's not what this book of confessions is about this is about beliefs that we get that are from the Bible and it helps us to understand what God is all about. So for us, we have the Bible, we have the book of confessions, and then we also have our book of order, which is like the rules and regulations. You know how when you're playing a game and you have to have the rules so that everybody knows what to do and it's fair for everyone. Well, that's kind of what our book of order is about. It's the rules and regulations that we follow so that we can worship the Lord together and get along well. So for Presbyterians, we have three books that we use, and they're all based on the first book, which of course is the Bible. And then we have our book of confessions, and then we have our book of order. The book of confessions and the book of order make up our constitution just like the United States of America has a constitution. So when you look at this window, think about the Bible, but also think about the books that we have 
that help us to understand what the Bible is all about, our book of order and our book of confessions. And now let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we thank you for giving us the word that we believe in, the statements that we say, like the Apostles' Creed, and also the rules that, that we can live by so that we can get along together and, and understand what to do. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, that's all. Thank you. Until next time. Once again, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you. We thank you for this day that you have made and for this opportunity to worship you, to hear your word read and proclaimed, to sing praises to you. And while we are unable to fellowship with one another, we know that you are among us. Lord, I thank you for grace and our members, our families. Lord, even though we are not worshiping together, we are still able to glorify you. We are still able to do your work. And I praise you for all those who are, are working so hard to give glory to you and to further your kingdom. Lord, we continue to pray for our nation. We give thanks to you for a peaceful transition we pray for our leaders and our elected officials. And Lord, we also pray that this pandemic, this COVID-19 may soon pass. We pray that the, the vaccine is, is able to be distributed quickly. And we lift up those whose livelihoods have been affected, those who have lost jobs, those whose small businesses are affected. We pray for those who have been sickened with the, the virus, but also those who have lost loved ones. Lord, you know the need is great. We continue to pray for those in our congregation. We lift up 
Monica and George and Coco to you, as well as Haddison and Courtney. Lord, we pray for our first responders and our, our National Guard members and those who work so hard to keep our country safe. Lord, we ask that you comfort those who are in grief and those who, who are in mourning at this time. And we also pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke. And I am reading chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And also were, and, and also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everyone and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, I talked about three call stories, as you hopefully will remember. We talked about the call of Samuel. We talked about the calling of some other of the disciples. And I also talked about the call of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., since it was the, uh, the holiday that we honor him on Monday. So with that same theme, I'd like to continue with two more call stories today. The first is the prophet Isaiah, and the second are the fishermen Peter, James, and John. So when we read stories like this, we read the, the story from Isaiah, and there are angels, the, the seraphim there, and the, the tongue, uh, the tongs with the hot coal touching the prophet's lips. It seems like a, a fantastic story. Also, Maybe less fantastic, but, but still amazing is, is the story of Simon Peter and the fishermen uh, putting down their, their nets and they haven't been able to catch anything. And yet when they, they reach, pull up the nets with Jesus there, there, there are so many fish that they're worried their boat might sink. They have to call upon another boatload of fishermen to come and help them. So did these things really happen this way? Well, you know, people debate this. They say, well, you know, some of the stories in the Bible are, are just meant to be uh, symbolic. They're, they're allegories and, and, and uh, not meant to be um, interpreted literally. Other people say, no, every word in the Bible is true just as it happened. And you have to, to, uh, to take these stories at face value. 
and, and even the miracles, no matter how uh, fantastic, how, how unlikely they might be, that, that we have to accept them as written. I can point out that each miracle that Jesus did provided a need, even with the, the wedding at Cana, the very first miracle, uh, provided a need for the, the wedding couple there. But also the, the healing of, of the blind and the lame, healing of, of, of all these people, and even a miraculous catch of fish. I think these stories stand on their own but they also provide a deeper meaning. They provide a lesson to us. And you know, we have the, uh, the time with young disciples and, and, and uh, you know, I try to keep it on a, a kid's level and, and provide something that, that, that you can, can understand very basically. I think that also adults sometimes need the, these tangible symbols, need, need uh, these lessons, these object lessons, if you will. I think about St. Patrick and the shamrock in which he, uh, he explained the, the uh, concept of the Trinity to people using a very common plant, something that they would understand, something that they would remember. All the people in today's stories, call stories, and last week's call stories, were called and sent. And that's what I want to focus on today, people who are called and sent. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? The Lord asks in Isaiah. Jesus also called these disciples and sent them out. And it's an old saying that's, that uh, God doesn't call the qualified, but God qualifies the called. Because sometimes people think, well, I'm not worthy. You know, the Lord can't call me because I'm a sinner. The Lord can't call me because I'm not qualified. The Lord can't qualify me because I'm not good enough. But the Lord does call us. And sometimes we do reply, Oh, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Simon Peter said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And even St. Paul described himself as the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle. Now, I know that some people have this idea, which is not correct, this idea that only pastors, only ministers of the word and sacrament are called. And for everybody else, well, you know, you have to, to labor at, at some job and you have to, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the curse of, of Genesis, you know, working by the sweat of your brow. But, um, you know, that's not the case. I believe that all of us are called. And it's not that, that work is some kind of punishment. I know in, uh, in, in Genesis it said uh, that God says to, to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Well, that sounds kind of grim, but the Lord also gave us this, this earth and all the things in for, for us to enjoy and to glorify God. Now, I know that, that some people have to, to work in professions. Some people get whatever work they can find and, and, and work very hard and maybe are not so happy doing that work. It's important to provide for our families. It's important to, uh, to, to do something to put food on the table and a roof overhead. And even my, my grandfather had that idea. He said that, that you know, if you enjoy your work, it's, it's a great luxury. But the main thing is to work hard at whatever job you can find. Preacher Clarence Jordan once said, a hot day behind a slow mule has called many to the ministry. Well, we believe as Presbyterians in the priesthood of all believers. And as it says in 1 Peter 2, 5, like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house 
into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. There's that phrase again, call you out of darkness, call and sent. So I'm t telling you today that not just certain people are called, we are all called. God calls all believers and we are a priesthood of believers. And the work we do is something that can glorify God, not just to put food on the table, but to give us labor. I talked about St. Patrick a few minutes ago, and, and we know the story. We think about St. Patrick's Day, which uh, comes around in March. And there are a lot of legends. There are a lot of stories about St. Patrick. But he was a real person. He was born about the year 389 in what is now Britain. And when he was around 16 years old, he was kidnapped by Irish pirates. That seems funny to say, Irish pirates, but he, he was, and he was sold into slavery. There he worked as a shepherd, and after six years, he escaped from his bondage in Ireland. And against his parents' wishes, he returned to Ireland after having a vision. He felt called to go to the people of Ireland and evangelize evangelized there to, to spread the gospel in Ireland. He felt called and sent, so he went back. There he preached the gospel and baptized people. He stood up to the pagan and the Druid priests at the time and brought Christianity to Ireland. St. Patrick was called by God and sent. Even my own calling to the ministry, you know, I had saved money, and, and I know I've mentioned this before, I had saved up money, and uh, the seminary tuition uh, quickly wiped out my, my uh, savings, and I wondered how I was going to pay. I even had to work two jobs part-time. I worked in an office, um, and then I also worked in the seminary dining hall, washing dishes at first. I, I started out washing dishes and, and, uh, and then moved up to, to the serving line, which was a, a better job there. But, but I had to, to do these two jobs and, and also depend on gifts from people. So the Lord provided and I was able to finish a seminary and graduate without borrowing any money. I felt called and I felt sent. God called me and, and sent me here to the people of Grace Presbyterian Church. God called the prophet Isaiah. He called Peter, James, and John. He called St. Patrick. He calls you and me. Well, does this mean that we have to drop everything we do like the fishermen? 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, However that may be, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to you, to which God has called you. There's that phrase again, to which God has called. This idea of vocation. Vocation is, is a, a word that means calling. And we think about vocational education as, you know, learning a skill, learning a trade, exploring a career. But it's, it's also this idea that God is calling us into something. It might be a ministry like, like this one, or it might be something else. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians to say, let each of you remain in the condition to which you were called. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. I would say that all of us are called to some kind of ministry, maybe to a prophetic ministry like the prophet Isaiah, or to be an apostle like Simon Peter or James or John, or even a missionary like Patrick. But what is God calling you to do? Called and sent. God calls each of us and sends us out to do his work in the kingdom. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for these prophets and apostles for the saints, for the missionaries, those who have, have done so much to further your kingdom, to preach the gospel. 
but we know that, that you call ordinary men and women and call people in all walks of life. And sometimes you call us to step away from the work we are doing. And sometimes you call us to remain doing what we were doing and to serve you in some kind of ministry. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness to us. And we ask that you help us to respond to the call that you give us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our creed today is the Apostles' Creed, and I invite you to say it with me at home. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our worship is now concluded. Before we go, let's say our charge together. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. 
Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you go, receive this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.